So we kind of wanted to finish with a couple of questions. I've put a couple there of which we thought it would be very nice to share some stories if we've got time with people in the chat uh, and, and afterwards. So what has the Incessional done for you thinking of this beyond the AP idea and, and where has it taken you? But I'm gonna hand back over to Tim um, uh, just for the last slide because we also had some other questions that came out of the book. And I think Tim, you want to ask one in particular uh, before we get started on that. Yeah, I mean, this, this slide of questions might be rather messy actually. And, uh, it... I don't know how this part of the presentation is going to um, develop, but I, I do think we see the book as the beginning of uh, a scholarship journey, if you like. And uh, we're just wondering if anyone has well read the book, you know, do we have a reader? Um, but also, has anyone really used the book as part of an effort to develop or to change in sessional provision? I'm just wondering, you know, the feeling for us is we write a book, it gets published, there's a sense of satisfaction from that, but there's very little knowledge about how it's received. Um, and we just wonder if it's been of use to anybody or not, in fact. That, that's quiet. Um, I've, I've used it, uh, yes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I've used it I've, and I've read m most of it and uh, it's it's really helpful. The It's really helpful. I found it helpful in framing things. It raised issues that I kind of got towards a little bit but hadn't maybe put pinned down. There's some terms of phrase that I found very useful. I'm just going to think one off the top of my head now, but there were, there were a, a number of those. So, yes, I, I am one of the readers, I believe. Thank, thank you, Deke. I can see in the chat as well, Martha, Angela, Judy, Kimberly, Dagmara, there's, you know, some of you have read it and there's kind of positive feedback coming through. That That's great to know, actually. It's very reassuring. Thank you. Um, the the other questions, sorry, I'm still reading. But yeah. Can I just say, Tim, I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, also, it's very interesting, if, but please do get in touch with us if you want to say about how you've been using it, because that would be very interesting. Because, uh, I mean, from our description of the purpose of the book, it was sort of, I think with the reflection as well, it's uh, this idea of maybe if you're setting up new provision, but also if you're already doing stuff, but sort of want to evaluate your provision. Um, because obviously, evaluating the impact of incession is another area which is really tricky and so maybe it might be useful for that so we'd love to hear about any examples of you know how you've been using it um if it's just using it as a doorstop or something that, that's not so interesting but you know obviously if you've been <laughs> if you've been applying it but have you been applying it i don't know in like teacher training or have you been applying it to your own practice so that would be really interesting to know oh i can see some more things coming in there now. sorry tim i interrupted There's, i've just been reading rather mm. than listening to you neil there's a lot of lovely things coming through actually it's it's really great to read um, just by the way, on the, the slide, these questions that are there, something we haven't mentioned about the way we structured the book is each chapter, uh, as part of this principle of it being a reflective guide, it ends with a series of questions for the reader. So uh, these are very often open questions just to try to locate your provision within the field that we're describing in a chapter. And so these questions just on the side are, are kind of a potpourri really of, of questions that do feature in the book uh, in various chapters, but they speak to some of the themes that, that Neil and I have been talking about today. So I don't know if, if these are of use um, to discuss now, or indeed if you have any questions for us as authors. In terms of measuring impact, we've got kind of a wider project at Leeds that we're calling the impact project where different colleagues are looking at the impact in this because we're embedded in schools and the schools that we're embedded in. And I'm currently embedded in food science and nutrition and I have run focus groups and I've had questionnaires. But the issue I come back to with measuring impact is the people that have volunteered are the people that have chosen to come to my classes. <laughs> And what I don't know is why people haven't chosen to come and how we could potentially have an impact on them. Because I feel like all of the data I'm collecting is quite biased. It's all lovely. It's like a big, you know, tick on my ego. But why are the other percentage not coming and how? I find that really hard when you're looking at impact. 
I mean, that'd be very interesting as a conversation between Bristol and Leeds, because we're also looking at our evaluation of our intersessional this year. So if you, it might be interesting to talk to uh, Lisa, Lisa Hansen about that, because um, it's, it's a project that we've been working on. We, we tend to be embedded, so we're actually timetable, so students have to come to our sessions. Doesn't mean they do, but, um, but we've had an issue where we wanted to look at evaluating our impact in, um, for example, the evaluation data that, that is collected anyway as part of the, the process within the, the units that we work in. But we find with that that you very often don't get mentioned or you don't, you know, or actually response rates to the kind of official um, student evaluation is not that great either. So it is, it's, you know, so it's, it's always a tricky area. I mean, that's a massive area, I think, for international, isn't it? How do you evaluate what you do? Yeah. But yeah. And from all the different perspectives, right, from the schools that you're embedded in, from the students, from it, it's massive. Like a 360 degree thing, isn't it, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, Jenna, you, you see the problem with not being able to reach uh, the students who aren't coming and, and not provide the whole picture. When reporting to stakeholders in the university, uh, do they have that same critical framing or are you able to tell a good news story about... In yeah, provision. It's generally so I'm seconded to food science and they currently have 262 PGT students on their PGT programs. So the sessions are capped anyway at around 25. So they know that I can't reach anyone. So they're just quite grateful. And they when I've asked staff to fill in questionnaires, it's all been quite positive. But I feel like I'm not reaching. The, I, what I feel like, because it's optional and people sign up, is that actually I'm getting the students that probably don't need it. And when I run the focus groups, a lot have said, oh, I came because you can probably help me go from getting a merit to getting a distinction. Yeah. And they're the students that I'm reaching, but I'm not reaching the others. But the school is very positive. Yeah, and actually, uh... they're changing it in food science. They're changing it next year. And I'm co-leading two credited modules. So it will go out to everybody because they it's a compulsory, two compulsory modules. So it becomes a bit more like the provision that Neil um, coordinates. Yes. Yeah. But that, that situation you're describing of like highly motivated, uh, outcomes driven students that may not need it in the way that maybe a needs analysis shows is, you know, it came through time and time again in our interviews and speaks to our own experiences as well, of course. Yeah, definitely. I was just looking at the chat there's some interesting things that you're mentioning here so something about the different cohorts and how cohorts are changing that's a really interesting uh, thing to look at and I noticed thank you some some comments for example about um, people who've been looking into the book in context that are outside the UK so we did try to reflect that in the book so we did speak to people in off the top of my head Sweden Norway South Africa Australia as well but but it it was mostly UK um, uh, but to try and reflect that. And there are very important differences. So for example, in Australia, we spoke to people where there is a kind of language policy which enables centres, EAP centres, to have a kind of seat at the table in all discussions anyway. And that was that's quite interesting. So I think another thing that'd be very interesting would be to know if this book, if our book is useful, if you're working in a context outside the UK, if you're working in a context in a more sort of what could be termed like an EMI context rather than an Anglophone university EMI context, you know. So, but it'd be interesting to know um, that sort of thing as well. That was one thing. Um, yeah, I saw the, your comments as well, um, Neil from SOAS. I think that's a real shame about your in-session. I remember talking to you about that before, but yeah. Um, hopefully you can bring it back with some entrepreneurial, I don't know, but it's, yes, it's, I think that's the other thing is it's, it's very different from one institution to another, like what your potential is. Um, as well. Sorry, I, I haven't been able to read all the comments there, but I've seen there's been a dialogue about SOAS. Is it is it the the fact that it's it's not income generating? Is is that the issue? Uh, yeah, it's it's sorry, just to butt in. Yeah, it's it's um uh, the whole of the English provision, um, including the foundation courses, is being restructured. So we we um, teach in sessionals out of our um foundation course uh teaching staff so um it's kind of they're they're restructuring the whole shebang together and they've included in sessional but they they've 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 kind of calculated the, uh, the deficit that we're uh, making um by factoring in in sessional into that calculation when it's actually a central service which we find pretty bizarre 
anyway, sorry. Yeah, it's it's an ongoing issue here at SOAS. So um, yeah, but uh, I, I hope other people aren't affected in a similar way with um, with uh, restructuring and so on. Okay, thanks. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? I think there's also, you know, kind of convincing. And I think that was something that one of the quotes in the book about, um, you know, the value of incessional, the fact that, you know, it might not be an income generating area in per se, um, uh, in terms of what you do as an EAP centre. But if you don't have an incessional, it, it kind of means that you don't have that connection to the wider university or like, you know, however you do it, um, whether it's sort of like the Leeds model or kind of like the, the, the sort of the Bristol model of doing it, whether it's a convent or not, if you don't have that connection, that does that does have implications. So maybe one way of trying to sell it is this idea of, you know, we need to be involved. But I mean, that was why I was thinking about the Australian context, this idea that there's a language, a national language policy. So you're going to have someone who has to, in, you know, be in there, talk about language, but um, I don't know, could that be? Would it all, and is that what what we would want? And um, would that uh, would that benefit the incessional? I wouldn't look to the office for students for a language <laughs> policy to 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 sort of enable a positive incessional experience. And embedded is coming across as a big a big thing here as well. Um, oh, question for Tim and Neil, Rob. Hi, Rob. Um, sorry, I just started to sound like a, a radio DJ then, no, but um, what have you learned through this book project that could contribute to our understanding of the AP as a discipline stroke practice in general, rather than in session or as a distinct form of activity? So what have we learned about EAP rather than in sessional? So I got to read the question out, which means that Tim can answer it, I think, um, first, would that work? <laughs> or anyone else? Yes. Uh, but yes, no. um... I don't know. I need to give that some thought. I think it's a very good question. And I feel um, one of our things we've been trying to do is to try to define a quite amorphous integrated space and trying to, if you like, codify what the activities are. So probably, you know, we, we've been working in the, the opposite tendency compared with... Um, with the way that question is going. I think it's an important question and one for reflection, but I'm not sure if I could answer it just off the cuff like that. Sorry, yeah, a pretty pretty horrible, horrible question. Um yes, thanks, I, I guess I guess it just it just came up. I mean I was thinking about it as um I think it was when Neil was talking about um kind of practitioner roles. And I, I felt it myself and this idea of being, you know, kind of uh, we can only really consider ourselves fully fledged academics in terms of our relation to discipline, other disciplinary practices. It's almost like EAP itself is not, is not enough or is not legitimate um, to be considered, you know, where the learning happens, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I, I felt that myself and I, I just kind of feel like, well, you know, learning happens in pre-sessional courses and learning happens in foundation programs and in these other contexts and what, um ways of maybe talking about or thinking about those activities that could give them that sort of legitimacy which they uh, you know, yeah. I, I think I think that word on the previous slide the distilling might be a really interesting thing to explore here this is the sort of the role in terms of the unpacking and distilling in kind of something there in that role which I think would be a common feature of EAP um sort of the kind of guiding students in reflective consciousness raising like the approach because I was thinking before where I said I passed it over to Tim to answer first so that I had a bit of thinking time um I was thinking of that the kind of interconnections interrelationship the idea of like maybe EAP being a, an interdisciplinary thing I think it's it's very it's very 21st century it's very now isn't it like what we're doing it's kind of it's it's you know pedagogy is changing isn't it in in, in higher education in, in lots of ways and so we're very much part of that I think and that, that our presence within universities is very much part of that but maybe in terms of the kind of teaching I don't know I, I that the, the, the distilling thing really kind of came out to me when I was rereading the book actually um so I don't know. I think that might be that might be where that answer lies. 